Hi everyone, welcome to Westside Online again today. It's great to have you joining us. Well, we're continuing our series, Why Can't We All Just Get Along? Something that your mother used to say to you probably, but it's a relationship series that's looking at how we, we broaden, how we deepen, and how we strengthen our relationships together. Years ago, I used to be a youth pastor. I did uh, youth and children's ministry for a lot of years, um, even when I was... A, a, a pastor would do youth groups on the side and, um, and things like that and really loved that ministry and I loved the car that we bought in order to help us with that ministry. We had a Mazda MPV and it was an eight seater, had three seats right in the back, three in the middle and two at the front. So it was always great for transporting people around, um, it was great for events, we, I could have a lot of people, you know, if we were doing a um, taking people somewhere, I could say, well, I'm a driver and I've got seven seats that we can do. And it was great for bringing the kids around. Um, I loved the car, not so much the family, but I really loved it. It was, a, it was a good workhorse, but it had a fault. It had um, an issue with a gearbox. Now, I, I knew about four youth pastors at the same time that had the same car. It was um, probably a popular model like that because it, it just didn't have the seven. It was the eight seat. It was a, a bit a bit extra. And even with three kids that we had, the, the back three seats could fold down and you could fit luggage there as well as people or all people. So it was a great car. But as I said, it had a fault. Like a number of cars, you know, there's sometimes you see a safety recall. There's, a, there's an airbag fault on certain cars. Or uh, I heard one the other day that it could, it could overheat. Um, so every car has some time in its life, something that, that goes wrong, and some cars have this tendency. Well, the good old MPV had a gearbox issue, and I had a friend of mine say, look, I've just blown the gearbox, apparently it's a known fault. If you go to the, uh, to the mechanic, he'll be able to fix it. There's different things you can do with seals and oil and a few things, and we had people like that in the church, and, and I was able to get mine fixed, and I had no problems with that part anyway, it got a bit old in the end, and one day I saw a fellow youth pastor who I knew had one, and I said, oh, how's your car going? He said, oh, fine. He said, look, I've just heard it's a, it, there's an issue with the gearbox, and he said, oh, I've had no problems with mine. So, okay, we went on our way. Not a week later, and he rings me up and says, guess what? The gearbox is blown. So, every car tends to have that tendency. Every car has... Uh, something wrong with it where it tends to, to be a bit of an issue. If we apply that to human beings, I, I think the same is true. And it might not be a, a, a gearbox or, or something like that, but there's some issue with all of us. And, and I don't know every one of you, I don't know who's listening, it's one of the, the, the functions of being online like this, I don't know who's tuning in. But I reckon every one of us has this problem. And, and, and I think I know because it comes from our association with Adam and Eve. One thing the Bible is, I, I think, very good is it's a mirror. It holds up a mirror to our lives. And one of the things about mirrors is it just tells the truth. It doesn't, it doesn't you know, you can have a paintings that, uh, that, you know, put the best side or cover your blemishes. But a mirror just... It just shows you for what you really like. And sometimes we don't like that. We look at ourselves in the mirror and say, oh, I wish I didn't have this, wish I didn't have that. But the Bible is this mirror that shows us as we really are. And because we are related to Adam and Eve, all of us come from that line. There is, in a sense, a, a DNA, even a spiritual DNA that comes down to us that we have the same issues as they did. So to begin with today, to look at really answering that question properly, why can't we all get along? Like many things, Genesis is about beginnings, and this is the beginnings of why we can't get along with each other. It says in Genesis, the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. And one day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's the only fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it, and if you do, you will die. 
You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful, and the fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. She gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. And at that moment their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness, and they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Now there's a lot in that passage that we can look at. I looked at that over Easter about the fig leaf coverings and everything like that. But there's a couple of points that I want to bring out from that passage today. There's, there's a couple of things that Satan said and something that Adam and Eve did that I think we have inherited from them. First one, what the serpent said is, you will be like God. In a sense, he was right. They thought, at least, they would be like God. It's one thing to be made in God's image, but it's another thing to submit to God. It's another thing to want to be like God. And the temptation was for them that they would be their own God. There would be not anyone else to dictate to them. There would not be anyone else to tell them what to do. They would not be answerable to anyone. They can make up their own rules. They would know what's right and wrong, and they would make those rules accordingly for themselves, however they saw fit. That's the second thing. They would know good and evil. They could choose what's their good and what's their evil. They would get to choose what they wanted to do. And the third thing is that they hid. There was shame, there was nakedness, they were embarrassed about who they were. And as much as they tried and pretended and they had this inadequate way of covering themselves, they hid from God. Now if in my case with my car there's a tendency to blow a gearbox, if another car has a tendency to um, have the airbag fail or to overheat because of some part, each car, if you know a good mechanic, he will know that that car has that particular issue and that tendency to fail in that way. Well, every human being, I believe, has a tendency, and it may be stronger in some than others, to have one of these three things go wrong. And that is autonomy, independence, and isolation. Autonomy is that sense of saying, I can run my own affairs. I am God. Independence says, I can make up my own right and wrong. I don't have to have anyone else tell me what to do. I can sort that out. And isolation is hiding. Go away. Stop bothering me. I don't want to get to know you. I don't want to deal with you. I don't want you to know me. I'm going to hide. Now, there's a certain level at which those things are good. We don't want to be people who rely on each other all the time, um, who, who are so dependent on each other, it's codependence. Uh, we have in our churches, we, we call them autonomous local churches, where we do things separately, but there's a sense that we know that there's things that we can do better together than we can do by ourselves. It's good to be independent and not relying on, on financial help or something, you know, to do our own thing and, and, and not to be so needy that we're always with each other. The problem is... Those things can also be incredibly negative. They can be incredibly dangerous. To be independent, to be autonomous, and to be isolated from one another. Often we hear very tragically of the uh, shootings that happen in America. And there's been another one just recently. And it's interesting to hear the studies when they have tried to talk to these people if they have um, made it through and they're, they're not shot or shot themselves. If they go through and talk to them or talk to people who knew them if they did pass away. And often you hear that these people are described as loners. One of the magazines, a psychology magazine, said one thing we do hear in nearly every case is that the shooter was a loner. This aspect of the personality is described in various ways, that he is shy, withdrawn, isolated, reclusive, and so forth. We frequently hear 
that these individuals were marginalised, marginalised, not accepted by their peers, and not well liked in general. When you understand the, the mental process of these sort of people, they often marginalised themselves. They, they did things that weren't good, that didn't make them accepted by society. Now, I'm, I'm not saying, please hear me, I'm not saying that everyone who is a loner, everyone who is isolated, everyone who uh, feels marginalised is going to shoot people. I'm not saying that is the case at all. But it tends to be these people who are like that, it can be dangerous for them. And I don't know what it's like for you, but I find myself like that. If I separate from, from other people, if I don't um, run things that I'm thinking past people, if I'm not spending time with other people, it's dangerous. I make bad decisions. I jump to wrong conclusions. I can take things out of perspective because I don't have other people around to talk to. And that can be dangerous. And you and I, when we hold up the mirror, we all have this tendency. We want to be autonomous. We want to be independent. We want to run our own show. We don't want anyone else to tell us what to do. And if we're not careful, we can be isolated. We don't want people to know us. We don't want to know other people. And the stuff that we're going through, we can keep to ourselves. Now, as I said, it's not that everyone will, will go out and shoot people, but as I said last week, the study that showed from Harvard University, it just backed up what God said right at the beginning. It is not good for us to be alone. One of the things that's emphasized in the New Testament Sometimes we think that the, that the church, that, that, that faith, is about believing. And, and, and it is, but I think we do it a disservice when it's just about we just believe the right stuff, we just tick the right stuff off in our head, and that's all there is to faith. Another aspect that's often overlooked is that faith is about belonging. We see in the early church that's a pattern for us, that's an example for us is that they were devoted, those early Christians, to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, to the fellowship, and to prayer. It says every day they continued to meet in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. See, there was a commitment there Yes, to the teaching of the apostles. They got into what the, you know, this is, they were recounting what Jesus had taught them. And, and they were praying together and they were breaking bread. They were having communion on a regular basis. And that, that's why we do this regularly in this broadcast. But it also says they were devoted to the fellowship. They were devoted to each other. They were devoted to themselves as people. And they did that by meeting together. And there was this mixture particularly in Jerusalem to start, but it, it happened as the church grew into other places. There was a big meeting, the first church that met in Jerusalem. There were thousands baptized that very first day. And you see there it says they, they, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. The temple courts, I'm, I'm always reminded of the, uh, the areas in front of the big stadiums like Suncorp or, or uh, the Gabba here in Brisbane where we are. And it's that big gathering of people. And the church had those big gatherings because there were thousands of people there. But they also met in homes. It, it, it wasn't just the big. And we tend to think of church as just, just the big ones, the, the, the big meeting. And, and yet the early church had that balance of meeting together in large and small groups. And I know this is different because you're watching at, at, at home. And... Sometimes some of you are there and, and you're not able to, to mix with other people. You're not able to have that, that fellowship. And, and I think that's a real lack if you're not able to meet. If you're in home and, and I know some people are isolated for different reasons and uh, it's great that you can at least connect like this. And I guess as I finish the series and we've looked at a whole lot of things of wisdom in relationships and marriage and, and you know, 
how to be wise in, in the way we deal with things, setting boundaries in relationships and all that sort of stuff. But I want to look at practical ways of how we can better connect. And look, it, it's in a sense not rocket science. It's like we read in that early church. They devoted themselves. They said, we're going to carve out time. We've probably got other things to do. And I know our world and our age is very busy at the moment. Or because of our tendencies for isolation and independence, we don't want to do that. But there's no secret to it. It is Love is spelled T-I-M-E. The amount of time that we spend beyond a Sunday meeting together with other groups of people, there's, there's nothing like it. It's the pattern, it's the example of the early church. There's no other way around it. And so if, if you're at home, you can't get out, you know, I hope this is some sort of way. Maybe there's, there's other things that we can do as well. But as a church, we're going to commit to, to doing some other things. After church on Sunday, to have uh, morning teas and encourage people. Because it doesn't just happen. It doesn't just happen that, that people will gravitate because of this tendency, like my car, to, to do certain things. Because of our tendency to isolation, to independence and autonomy, we will tend to, oh, I've got other things to do. I just want to do my own thing. So you've got to decide, I'm going to carve out this time. I'm going to commit to this, even though it's going to cost me something else. So we're going to do coffees. We're going to do a thing called, guess who's coming to dinner? So what we're going to look at, we'll launch it in term three. But what we're going to look for is people to host. We want people who love hosting people at their home, cooking up a big meal, trying out that new recipe they saw on My Kitchen Rules or something like that. We want to see people who love to host. And we want to see people who love to eat other people's food and go to their place and try out what they're cooking. And we're going to put those people together and, and sort of do it in a creative way and just give people an opportunity to catch up together like that over you know, a good meal, good food, and have some good conversation and, and discussion. So we're going to do that in a couple of weeks' time. I also would love to get small groups going in the life of the church. There are some small groups that meet already, and that, that's been great. But I would love more and more people to just carve out some of that time through the week, um, beyond the Sunday, just to be able to get together, study God's Word together, pray together. And, and look, all of this is, is a way to practice what we call the one another's. Someone said there's 52 one another. There's one for every week. I'm not sure there's exactly 52, but there's a whole lot of instructions in the Bible, many about loving one another, being patient with one another, bearing one another's burdens, forgiving one another. And it's a shame when so many people really don't know each other well enough to have anything to forgive. We don't know other people and what they're going through enough to be able to bear their burdens. We don't know how to love one another. We don't know what is going to be best for other people because we really don't know them. We have a brief conversation at church. We say hi, but there's not that one-on-one, -on -one, one anotherness that we have in our regular routine. We might get that in other places. But in terms of mixing with other believers and doing what the early church said in in committing to being with one another, that doesn't happen enough. And so I really want to encourage you, wherever you're at, wherever uh, you're at, if it's possible, to be able to participate in some of these activities. With uh, the internet these days and even Zoom, some of our study groups that are, that are working at the moment, some people are on Zoom, we can possibly be able to connect like that. And it certainly is a way around... If, uh, if health-wise or otherwise you're not able to get out. So if you're interested in joining us with that, let us know and we'll keep you informed as we launch those things in the coming weeks. That's why we can't always get along. As I said, one of the things that the early church devoted themselves to in a, in a constant basis was to the breaking of bread. Initially, they, they celebrated it every day. It was like this, it was so fresh, it was so alive, it was so exciting to know that Jesus had taken away their sins. The, 
the sacrifice of Jesus was was just so current that they were doing that every day. And eventually they got into a pattern of doing it as they met on the Lord's Day on Sunday to remember Jesus in the way that he'd asked us to. And we're going to do that now as we share in communion together. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have shown us something that, that we can believe in. And that's important. But thank you that it's something that we can belong to as well. We're part of your family. Jesus is our brother. Lord, you are our father. And we thank you so much that you've given us this. You've not just called us out of darkness into light. You've, you've called us into your family. And we thank you that Jesus makes this all possible for us, that he makes it possible for us to be in relationship with you and with each other. And as we're doing this today, we're doing this with Christians all over the world who do it in their own time and in their own time zone, but we're a part of, of a great family. We recognize the body of Christ as we eat this, not just the physical body of Jesus that he gave us, but we're a part of something much larger than just where we are in our own homes now. And help us to sense that as we eat and drink together now, that we're a part of people all around the world who are doing this, who are participating in their own way to remember and honour Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's eat the bread together. Let's drink the cup together. Heavenly Father, we, we know we all have this tendency to want, want to run our own affairs, make up what's right and wrong for us, and hide from you and from each other. So Lord, help us to be able to, to know that there is a fix, there, that there is a way out of this. We don't have to just put up with, with this in our own lives. And the way you've encouraged us, the way you've commanded us to, to love one another, to care for each other, is the way to counteract that. So help us to, to take the commitment, to look at the commitment the early church had to these things and, and make it a part of our week. Lord, help people to realise that they're part of something much bigger, that we need each other. We need the relationships that we have with each other to grow and to develop. It's not just a personal, private faith. It's very much a corporate faith that we do together. So help us to understand that and do what we can to, to commit to that. Thank you for... This series and all that we've learned about the, the importance and the priorities of relationships. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks again for tuning in today. I really appreciate your, uh, your attendance here like this and, uh, and sitting through like this. And we'll see you next week. We have a big special treat. Uh, we have John Finkeldy coming. and He's a church consultant. We had John uh, last year and um, through COVID and yeah, there's all sorts of things that have, that have gone on since then. So John is coming again. He's uh, done a, a survey um, with some people in the church and he's going to speak to that uh, next Sunday. So we're going to go live uh, with John through the week and uh, on, on the Sunday and he's going to speak to us uh, live on that. So I hope you can join us for that. Thanks for tuning in for all the series why can't we all just get along and we'll be um, back with john next week so thanks for tuning in see you next time <music>